live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Hello out there, gentlemen. Welcome to yet again another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay at Scott McKay on both Twitter and Clubhouse. Real Scott McKay on Instagram. Find all the YouTube goodies by searching my name, S-C-O-T-M-C-K-A-Y on YouTube. The website is mountaintoppodcast.com. And I encourage all you guys out there who have not yet joined our Facebook group to do so by searching for the Mountaintop Summit on Facebook. Great group of guys there. With me today is a friend of mine. She's originally from Israel, and now she's in the Bay Area. She's the founder and director of the Bay Area CBT Center. Now, CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, of course. And today we're going to talk about something that is very, very, I don't know if it's dear or feared (laughs) in the hearts and minds of most of you guys out there, but we're going to talk about fear of rejection. We're going to use her vernacular for it, which is rejection phobia. And I think along the ways, we're going to talk about some of these nouveau phenomena that uh, we tend to experience when we're trying to get to know women like ghosting and zombieing and benching and love bombing and bread crumbing and all these other silly buzzwords that we hear about nowadays. But without anything further, Abby Lev. Welcome, Abby. Good to have you here. Yes, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I don't know if these guys are really excited about this conversation because it's going to probably rip open a bunch of scabs. But hey, you know what (sighs) happens after you rip open a scab? You get an opportunity to heal it, don't you? I was just about to say that. Yeah, see, now you and I are already on the same page. Yep. Got to love that. So you have written books, okay, and they're called ACT Act for couples and ACT for interpersonal problems. Tell us what ACT is and what caused you to feel passionate about talking about it in book form. Uh, What made me passionate about it is that rather than trying to change uh, our core beliefs, so I work with core beliefs in relationships and those are called schemas. I have 11 schemas that I work with like abandonment or mistrust, abuse, self-sacrifice, Um, entitlement, perfectionism. So we all have core beliefs and relationships. And when triggered, we do old behaviors with these core beliefs that then cause self-fulfilling prophecies. So act rather than getting us to change our thoughts or our feelings, which is really hard. Act helps us accept uh, difficult feelings and difficult uh, thoughts and sensations that come up. And it helps us do different behaviors anyways. So rather than making these experiences different, it actually helps us relate to these experiences differently so that our thoughts and our feelings don't have as much influence over the behaviors we do. Now, to be sure, what does ACT stand for? Acceptance and commitment therapy. So we accept uh, difficult thoughts, feelings, and sensations, and we commit to doing a behavior. And only when we do a different behavior do our beliefs then change. Because if I believe that I'm going to get abandoned in relationships and then I start seeking excessive reassurance and being attacking, where have you been? Who are you with? Who are you? Are you didn't text me back? If I do this, then I'm more likely to get abandoned only by changing the behavior. Will that belief shift? Now, it's amazing how many times, even from the very front end of a relationship, I mean, at the point where we're deciding whether or not we even want to walk up and introduce ourselves to a certain woman, let alone dating her, getting married, having children, whatever, we're already fearing loss. And I think for men in particular, that fear of loss really is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it sounds like we're already on the same page there, right? Yes, I would say that, for example, one very common schema for men is defectiveness, shame uh, and failure. So if you're moving into a situation already expecting to fail or to be shamed, then there's many ways that you could create a self-fulfilling prophecy where that actually occurs. So for men, that would be, I'm not good looking enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not what any woman would want. I'm not rich enough. I'm not in her league. Uh, Something bad is going to happen if I talk to this woman. She's going to be mean to me. She's going to be nasty to me. She's going to 
absolutely poke right at that limiting belief that is my most dreaded one, that sort of thing, right? That's kind of the self-talk we give ourselves when we're experiencing this rejection phobia, isn't it? Yes, that's that's correct. So we could also seek excessive reassurance or we could filter and assume that rejection is happening where it isn't and then respond as if we're being rejected, which leads to rejection. Wow. Now, there are several very, very important and fascinating concepts that you just threw out there rapid fire. (laughs) The one about the last one in particular where we feel like we've been rejected when really we haven't, that's massive. I mean, along with the expectation that we're going to be rejected, uh, these fantasies about being rejected before it even really happens, and all the other things you just mentioned, uh, boy, so many men feel that. And so many men fall into those sort of traps time and again, and we feel like we're our own worst enemy somehow, because many times that means we don't even give this poor girl a chance to accept us or reject us or even to talk to us because the assumption is already there. We're going to fail. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're also living in a world where there's a lot of ghosting, right. Or, or kind of dehumanizing type of behaviors or people start getting afraid. And so, you know, with the online dating and all of these, uh, Uh, new modern dating kind of behaviors that we've learned, what happens is now if somebody actually has an emergency and needs to cancel a date, we are seeing it as being rejected or being ghosted. We don't know, right? Like when somebody's just actually had an emergency or isn't feeling well versus when they've rejected us. Yeah, especially since the excuse of having a family emergency is sort of the most bulletproof one you can think of, because who's going to argue with that? Therefore, the most abused excuse people can think of, right? When they're simply right. just trying to flake on you or breadcrumb you or benchwarm you or whatever right, it is right, they're right. doing. Those, right. Yeah. Yeah. And then if we respond in a certain way, if we if we think we're being rejected and then we start kind of backing up and rejecting the person or abandoning them – then it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy of rejection. Yeah, that's right. Or if we start attacking them or accusing them of rejection or seeking reassurance, that also will lead to rejection. You know, I've said to these guys over and over again, Abby, that the number one indicator of being successful with women, and by that I mean, you know, let's look at the baseline here. Simply approaching women and having them respond positively to you and actually going out with you. The number one indicator of success among men, and this is after 16 years in this business and being immersed in it, is they actually believe women will want to go out with them. It's that confidence. So, yes, a lot of guys. And I mean, women are completely nonplussed by this, by the way. And you can comment on that if you want. But men will go up to women expecting them not to like them. Or expecting to lose. And it's like, all right, well, you know what? Just so I feel better about myself, I guess, I'll go ahead and ask this woman out and get it out of the way so I don't have to worry about it anymore. And the women are like, well, you know, I might have gone out with this guy, but he just seemed so negative or he seemed like he didn't even like me much. He was already kind of on the defensive against me and it just felt kind of weird or off. So yeah, you know what? The answer is no, I'm not going out with you. And it is a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? Well, you know, Scott, I'll actually, I'll disagree a little bit here because the reason why I really love acceptance and commitment therapy is because in this type of situation, uh, you know, the theory would say you don't really have to feel differently. You don't have to feel confident. You don't have to feel good about yourself. You could just do the behaviors of confidence and still get the same outcome. So you could feel really undeserving and really ashamed or really unworthy, and you could still do the behaviors, for example, making eye contact, listening, asking questions, being curious, being interested, uh, and that will get you just as far along, even if you don't feel it. You know, you, you just kind of fake it till you make it, but it works. Well, I think at some level that's fair. I mean, if you look like you're confident, that will be credited to you as confidence. But I think a lot of guys may be saying to themselves, yeah, how am I supposed to come off as authentically confident and have women not smell that like a Doberman smells fear when, you know, it would really work better for me if I legitimately did believe women should like me? Because I don't think women want a guy who's confident in the sense that he's like, I'm really good at sports and I'm really attractive and I'm really tall. Like that's, I'm really rich. Like that's not the confidence that we're looking for. 
we're looking for somebody who's comfortable in their skin, right? So for me, confidence, and most women, confidence is being comfortable in your own skin, you know, uh, being honest, being forthcoming, you know, knowing your values and where you stand and what you're about and, and being consistent with those. Well, let's level set here. I draw a huge distinction between confidence and arrogance. You know, I think for sure. the guy who thinks that he's God's gift to women and fully expects every woman to like him, even when she's telling him to go away, that's douchey and that's negative. Okay. So that's the pendulum swinging the other way. But given that I believe most men are experiencing this rejection phobia that we're talking about today, at least on some level, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt such that if they're portraying an attitude such that they believe that they're good enough and valid enough, and you know, let's just go ahead and extrapolate that a little, a good choice for this woman to date, then that's more likely to turn out in their favor than say going up to a woman and saying, you know, I'm sorry to bother you. And I already know you don't want to give me your number and I'm probably not enough for you, but you wouldn't want to go out with me, would you? She's probably going to go, you know, you're right. No. So <laughs> I, I agree. I think that if, <laughs> if, if you're coming in there, um, kind of, you know, the, the word would be priming, right? In behavioral terms, you're priming the woman to say no. Right. So if you're going, you really want to say no, it seems like you want to say no, I don't really deserve you. If you're going to do those behaviors, then yes, you're less, yes. You're, you're, you're less likely to get a date. You're more likely to get rejected. But I still want to distinguish that you don't have to feel more confident to still get that date. Well, I'm going off what you said before about these guys kind of blaming a woman for rejecting them, even when it wasn't really a rejection. So in that context, the exact formulation that I just gave of what a guy might say and how it might turn out is far more likely to happen. Ultimately, I think you and I are in agreement here. I think if a guy feels like he has a chance here, he's more likely to have a chance. How's that? Whether I do the behaviors or whether I don't do the behaviors that are going to lead to looking like I'm confident and feeling like this might go well, that is going to be the case no matter what. You know, you have to at least give it a chance as a guy. Well, one uh, technique that I use with clients, both with couples and individuals or in dating or in relationship, is identifying your core values. And values are like a compass. They're a compass that helps us guide our behaviors and help us choose the behaviors we want to do in any given situation. So values are different from goals because a goal can be achieved and a value is a constant journey. So like honesty is a value. I could never be 100% honest, Abby, because if I'm being honest right now, but then the next minute I lie, I'm no longer honest. So what I would recommend it to men is be clear on your values and what kind of partner you want to be and move towards, you know, your dating life with intention of moving towards those particular values. And values are not feelings. Values are actions. So it's being honest, being collaborative, being fair, being spontaneous, being adventurous, uh, being compassionate, being kind. The more aware you are about the kind of partner that you want to be and the kind of partner that you want, the more you move towards these values, the more likely you are to create that type of relationship. Bravo. Absolutely. You know, we call that deserving what you want around here. In order to get the kind of woman you want to be with, you first have to be the kind of man she's going to want. Now, see, sure. I would say that that parlays into a better feeling towards asking women out. And also you talked in detail just now about what I would term connectable traits. And any of these guys who own my Invincible program have already heard me talk about this at length. Instead of thinking about, okay, what do we have in common? How can I impress her? And by the way, for the record, I suspect you and I are in agreement that being impressive is not the same as being sexually attractive. And I think most people completely miss that, but that's a different story. We agree on that a hundred percent. Why do people try to impress each other? There are so many people who I find immensely impressive yet. I don't want to date them or have sex with them. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well also exactly. doing a behavior where somebody could see you're trying really hard to impress them is actually oh, very unattractive. Yeah. Counterproductive. Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, I think the very notion of being impressive to them, even if you succeed at pulling it off still has little to no value. Kind of like you and I like the same flavor of ice cream. 
and you and I uh, went to the same church on Sunday or whatever it is, all these ways we try to find where we have something in common, common experiences, they're worthless too until you have the attraction. And what really matters, and this seems so obvious to me, Abby, yet nobody talks to it, is exactly what you said. There are certain traits that if you're not a broken individual, like you're not some BPD person who just loves drama and throwing a wrench in your whole works known as life, then most people who are healthy psychologically are looking for the same things in a partner, an honest person, an optimistic person, a healthy person, a generous person, a kind hearted person, as opposed to a black hearted person, the more of those boxes you check off as a human being, the more likely you're going to start getting along with other human beings. And perhaps the confidence that is the Holy Grail we're talking about here, instead of it being this outward, uh, I guess, hubris, where I feel like perhaps I'm God's gift to women without any foundational elements to that, without it being grounded in some truth. Uh, you know, that may be as worthless as trying to, I don't know, impress a woman like we just talked about. But hey, if I am an inherently attractive person with these connectable traits, sooner than later, if you put this to the social test out in field as a man or a woman, frankly, you're going to find people like you. People want more of you. You're more charming than the opposite. And then once you feel like, hey, you know what? This is going pretty well. I don't scare away people. Children don't run away screaming when they meet me. I'm not creepy, weird. I'm not pushy. I'm not doing these things that contribute to social downfall, but I'm doing these things that contribute to things going better for me socially. Then you feel better about perhaps approaching that woman and maybe asking her out instead of just making small talk. But backtracking a little, I think a lot of guys don't even get to that point. They're so scared of the rejection that they forget to have a conversation. And I guess where I want to go with this right now is getting your views, Abby, on whether you feel like men should even be seeing an approach scenario with a woman that could potentially turn romantic as a competition of acceptance versus rejection to begin with. Isn't it really just a conversation? Don't we have the right to evaluate each other in this little talk we're going to have? Well, I guess I would ask the question, what's so bad about rejection? Like, I think that the dilemma that we get in when we really worry about being rejected is then we stop actually assessing the person in front of us, right? If I'm really insecure and I'm wondering, am I saying the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Do I look okay? If I'm so self-focused, I'm not really paying attention. Like, is this person honest? <laughs> is this person attractive? Is this person interesting? Is this somebody I'd want to keep being with? Right. So, you know, the more we're afraid of rejection, actually, the less available we are to assess whether that person's even as attractive as we think they are. I think that's right on the money. I think that's a brilliant, intuitive observation. So many of us are so worried about ourselves that we can't get out of our own way. Literally. Right. And we take ourselves so seriously, don't we? Oh, my God, I've been so disrespected or this woman thinks I'm a horrible person or won't go out with me. And it's because I'm subject to this limiting belief or that one. And in reality, I've known guys who get the hots for a woman who's no darn good for them. They're not going to match up. They're not going to. Right like each other. They're coming from completely different mindsets. And then when it doesn't work out, the guy was so focused on acceptance versus rejection that he feels worse about himself when he was barking up perhaps the wrong tree from the beginning. Right. And I have clients all the time that come to me for therapy and they're telling me about their online dating experiences as if it's so personal. Like I get rejected and I can't find someone and it's so hard. And it's like, yep, that's just online dating. That's not you. It's not personal. That's everyone. I don't yeah. really, I don't have many clients that are doing online dating and are feeling like, wow, everybody wants me. And this is really great. This is really helping my self-esteem. It's actually, it's, you know, it's, it's a rough experience and it does come with a lot of rejection. It's not personal. Yeah. We've talked about this on this show. The whole state of online dating and apps has really been engineered by the dating and app companies to feed the addiction of wanting likes without ever giving us the satisfaction of getting into a relationship because it helps them more than it helps their constituents. 
Correct. For sure. And you are in San Francisco, <laughs> which could be the absolute worst online dating market in the entire country. I believe there's research that does say that. Yes. Yeah. Rough. <laughs> yes. Rough. Yes. But everybody thinks they're the only person in the world who's not achieving some sort of wild success on apps. And really, even the beautiful people are frustrated. Correct. Because even when they meet each other, all their pictures have been filtered and they don't look like who they said they were. And then by design, their online profiles are so vapid and brief that they don't know anything about each other. And then they don't fit in with each other. And then it yeah. doesn't go well. Yeah. I did a social experiment many, many years ago after many clients told me about their experiences and were convinced that if they look differently or that certain people have better experiences. And I went and I filled out a couple of just fake profiles just to chat with people. And I reached out to the men and the women that I thought were the most attractive. And I asked them about their experiences and they still say they get ghosted. They don't get a lot of messages. Sometimes they uh, get messages and then they don't get returned. I mean, everybody brutal. is struggling. It's brutal. Yes. It's yes. brutal for everyone. One quick note for these guys of optimism before we start turning to these buzzwords, because <laughs> we're going to have a lot of fun with those. Honestly and truthfully, Abby, help me out here if you can. Okay. If you blatantly disagree with me, you know, shout I me I will down. let you know. Yes. Okay. I don't think women particularly get off on being mean to men. I think if a guy's experiencing a pattern where every woman he meets is mean and rude to him, he needs to look in the mirror because he's doing something creepy, weird, or pushy. But if we're giving women space and we're being socially normal, I mean, establishing normalcy, to me, seems to be that one step that has been left out of all the pickup artist books of the past. I mean, just come off like a non-psychotic, socially acceptable, reasonable human being, give women space, be warm, be inviting instead of cold and prickly. And I think the chances are next to zero, a woman's going to be mean and purposefully nasty towards you. Am I right? Uh, I, I agree. I think that, you know, neither men nor women want to harm the other. We all want to be cooperative with each other and we need each other, but we do have to also be really clear about what the other person is looking for. Because when we're on online dating, people are on there for many different reasons. Some people are there just to get the likes. Some people are there for sex. Some people are there to get over their ex. Some people are there for a long-term relationship. So you may feel rejected only because that person never wanted the same thing that you wanted to begin with. Well, I guess I'm talking about even at a more simplistic level. And I agree with you, by the way. But like, let's say I see an attractive woman at the post office and I think I'm not going to say hi to her or make small talk, even though we're standing next to each other in line, because she's going to rip me a new one if I open my mouth. And I just think that's a that's an unreasonable fear. That is an unreasonable fear. We agree. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, Abby, I'd like to get your comments on this, too. A lot of guys think the more beautiful or more attractive I find this woman I'm potentially going to talk to, the greater the likelihood she's going to be abusive and mean to me. Crazy, right? Yeah, I disagree. I definitely Where disagree Where does that with come that. from? Why do we feel that? Where did that even simmer up from? It seems so irrational. Well, I, I think that that's definitely a belief that is on both sides, right? Like, when women uh, see men who are more attractive or tall, they think they're more likely also to be abusive or unemotional or unavailable. So I, I think that when we're really attracted to someone, we just want something more. And when we want something more, we're more afraid of not getting it. So it just feels more dangerous. Feels like more is at stake there. Right. Yeah, that's right. The analogy I've made in the past is like going to a job interview. If you're gainfully employed and making a half a million dollars a year and your competitor is trying to hire you away, you're going to have a decidedly different mindset going into that job interview than if you've been unemployed for two years and they're about to repossess your car tomorrow morning. The thing is, is that I do think that it's contextual, right? So for example, if you're on an online dating site and you reach out to an attractive girl uh, they're less likely to be mean to you. If you are, you know, having breakfast and you make eye contact with an attractive girl and you smile or say hello, they're less likely to be mean. If you are at work or, you know, she's standing in line and 
you know, instead of asking her if she has a boyfriend or if she's looking for someone, you, you know, try to get her number. Maybe that's something that's happening for her frequently. And then she's more likely to respond, you know, defensively. Well, I think there's something to be said for dancing this dance effectively instead of diving in head first, for sure. But I think that's, well, a lot of that's just social skill. Right. Yeah. It's reading the cues and making sure that you're not going straight for, hey, let's have sex, but like, <laughs> yeah. right, like smiling and then seeing, is this person open to you? And then after smiling, saying hello. And then if that person says hello back, then you go asking a question. And if they're the more open they seem, right, then you ask them out and it's less likely for you to be rejected. RTFR, read the room. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, for sure. No, I think that's good stuff. And I always love getting that reassurance from women who are smart, successful, and probably being sought after by men that indeed women aren't out there trying to be mean and reject men. And a lot of times the guys who I hear that fear the loudest and strongest from are often the guys who really aren't asking a whole lot of women out right now, either because they never have, or they've gone through a dry spell, or perhaps they did get that kind of really negative response from a woman somewhere along the way. And it just immediately shut them off from ever trying again. And all that sort of, I don't know, it's really unfortunate and something we kind of have to bounce back from perhaps in the way you described earlier, where we really just got to jump off the ledge a couple of times and tell ourselves we're confident, even if we really aren't yet. Right. Yeah, it was a really interesting article. I actually don't remember when, but Google was talking about how they like to hire people that are willing to fail and are and have had a lot of failures. And the idea is that the more you experiment and the more you take risks, the more failures you'll have. And I think, you know, this is the same. Uh, it's not about avoiding rejection or taking it personally. It's about actually increasing rejection. Go out there, get rejected, get rejected more. Like the more you get rejected, the more you create an opportunity for somebody not to reject you. But you can't create that without being willing to get through some of the hurdles. Well, I guess that goes back to my supposition that it really doesn't have to be a contest to begin with. I mean, if I'm having a conversation with a woman Am I rejected if I haven't given her anything to reject? Exactly. I just say, hey, you know, how do you choose a mango at the supermarket? She goes, well, right. I usually I squeeze it. It's like this and blah, blah, blah. And then if, you know, you don't like her voice, you don't like her personality, you don't like how she smells, you go, well, it's been nice talking to you. Happy mango hunting. And then you right. leave, you know, but you had as much say in the matter as she did. And if you have this sense of identity which is what you were getting at before. You know who the hell you are, and therefore you kind of know who the hell you would match up with. Then you're more likely to be able to adequately read the room, first of all, and then second of all, get you know sort of a feel towards whether this is a person you're going to get along with or not. And that's something that both of you can participate in. And it's amazing when you start clicking with someone, both of you will know it. As long as you're psychologically well adjusted and people who have some dating options, it's where we start feeling that desperation that we start trying to jam that relational square peg into a round hole. When if the other person does have the options, they can see that forest for the trees long before we can. And they're trying not to sound like they're rejecting us, but really they're right. We wouldn't be very good together. And it kind of takes some wherewithal to see that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Have you do, do you know what exposure therapy is in cognitive behavioral therapy? Explain. So in exposure therapy, for example, if somebody is afraid of a spider, uh, we do exposure by taking tiny little baby steps to bring that spider closer to us. So I thought we you were make... going to say by taking tiny little spiders and having <laughs> well, that, them hatch all over their body. <laughs> that's exactly where we're headed because at first we're going to chat about spiders. Maybe we'll draw spiders. We'll look at movies of spiders. We'll bring in a box of a spider in a closed box and then like a, a see-through box. At some point, we're going to want that spider to be on our hand and kind of pet it and go, oh, you're not so bad. It's not the end of the world. But the way that we teach exposure is by teaching uh, certain skills, distress tolerance skills, and um, mindfulness skills to help that person take very small steps in order to get to the bigger step. Have you ever and held a tarantula I, I, before? I, I have 
come close. I have come very close. But the, the thing is, is that I do the same thing with feelings. So if somebody is having a rejection phobia, we do the same thing with the fear of rejection. We take little baby steps with teaching skills to help you rather than get rid of rejection, right? Because we'll always have that experience in relationships. There's no way to be in relationship without feeling rejected. Even if you get her number, right? Even if you get married, you're still going to feel rejected at times. So part of what I teach people is how do you make friends with rejection? Like how does rejection not end up being so awful? What is it like to take small steps and get closer to it and actually make friends with it and notice what it feels like? And then you have a relationship with it where it's no longer having such a strong influence and you could still move forward and do the things you need to do, take those risks. So in other words, if I act like a normal person here, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'm right. not going to get arrested. I'm not going to get a drink thrown in my face, et cetera. Yeah, I like that. Perfect. So what is zombieing? Uh, zombieing is, you know, ghosting is when a person just disappears on you and you never hear from them. Zombieing is when a person who has disappeared and you haven't heard from then comes back out of nowhere as if they never ghosted you, as if nothing's ever happened. Which is fine as long as you're on the same page and it was kind of casual. I mean, it's not fine in the sense that if you were not okay with being ghosted and the person suddenly disappeared, you sent them a message and they just stopped responding to you, that then they come back as if nothing's happened, <laughs> you would want to assume that that behavior is going to occur again. It would be silly of you to think that they wouldn't do that again if you're just going to pretend like it was no problem. Then you just rewarded their behavior. Fair enough. I think that happens when someone has found someone better, apparently, yet temporarily. Correct. Yeah. What's benching? Benching is when you're seeing someone and you're kind of dating, but you don't give them any promises of a relationship. You don't make any commitments or any plans for the future. And so the relationship goes on and on without any you know, definition of what it is or ever it turning into anything more serious. Okay, so I'm assuming that would only be a real problem if someone was presuming exclusivity or expecting exclusivity and the other one wasn't. Correct. And or if someone's dating five or six people at once and you're fifth or sixth on the totem pole, you're going to get benched a lot. Not unlike the sixth or seventh guy off the bench on an NBA team. <laughs> right. Okay. Love bombing. What's that? Uh, love bombing is actually one of the most, the, the biggest red flag that I would see in relationships. So love bombing is when somebody falls in love with you really quickly and they say a lot of statements that make it seem like you're the best thing that's ever happened to them. So if you're with somebody for like a month and they're like, I love you, I want to move in with you, I've never felt this way before, uh, moving the relationship really quickly, that would be love bombing. And it's actually... Uh, a very bad sign because if somebody thinks that they love you so much so quickly, they're often projecting and they, they don't really know you. Uh, often people with an avoidant attachment style or certain personality disorders are more likely to engage in love bombing. Wow. So, I mean, that just sounds immature to me. That sounds like what happens in seventh grade. You know, we pass a note in homeroom. We are going together by 10 a.m. at lunchtime. We love each other. And by the time the bell rings at the end of the day, we've already broken up and can't stand each other. Correct. The, the dilemma, though, is that we're living in a world right now uh, with online dating and certain norms that actually end up moving the relationship quicker, right? Like if, if we look at research from years ago, the most common thing that led for people to be in a relationship was proximity. What that means is that the more you're around somebody, the more you end up liking them and wanting to be with them. Now it's reversed. You're kind of clicking left and right on these people like, like you're an Uber Eats or, or Amazon. And it's all internet marketing. Right. And, and then yeah. you're expected to have the answers of where the relationship is going after like your second date. People decide whether they are attracted to you or they want to be with you. So it ends up moving abnormally uh, quickly, which is not what we're used to. 
We are in the postmodern era of intensely short attention spans. Correct. Which is not relationship friendly for sure. Correct. There's a new one now. I just saw an article on pocketing. So now there's a new relate. I mean, it's interesting that there's new ones coming out all the time. You can't keep up, can you? <laughs> you really can't. Um, and pocketing is when you're dating someone and you hide them from your friends and your family. You don't introduce them to anybody. You keep them a secret. Yeah, kind of like the old joke about a moped. I don't know this joke. (laughs) She's fun to ride until your friends see you doing it. Right. Yeah, got it. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of people can relate to that. And you know where I think that comes from? I think that comes from a media-driven perception of what should be sexy and attractive when the reality for a whole lot of people of what they really are sexually attracted to and what does it for them is a lot different than what the media told us it should be. So we feel sort of embarrassed that we're hot for this person and actually like them. And we don't know how our friends would take it. And what I tell guys is, you know what, if you take your girlfriend out to meet your friends and they tell you that she's uh, not hot or she's too this or too that, and they laugh at you, don't be surprised if, and when, that sentiment succeeds at breaking the two of you up that one of those very friends who was laughing at you is the next one to ask her out. Right. Yeah. And then pocket her. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because they already know the social ramifications. (laughs) What a horrible way to live if you're that particular woman, right? I mean, imagine it's rough. Well, I think also that pocketing also involves self-shame because then you're feeling like you need a partner to validate your own self-worth, right? Or it could be, you know, if I introduce this woman to my friends or my family, she'll break up with me. She'll see what a loser I am and who I'm at with. Correct. Right, right, right. But there's something, it's it's like a kind of enmeshment, right? Like you can't have your own self-worth separate from who you're dating. And so they are like a barometer of your level of uh, attractiveness or self-worth. And it's it's problematic in general, that dynamic. Yeah, that kind of opens up the whole Pandora's box of getting in a relationship because you need something from this person or what they're going to bring or that they make up for some deficit in your life, which is usually a bad situation. Right. Like more about helping your status than how you actually feel with them on the day to day. Don't get me started on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I tell you what, we're out of time. This has been a fantastic conversation. What I want to do is help these guys discover your organization, Bay Area CBT Center. And I'm going to send them to the URL, which is mountaintoppodcast.com front slash lev, L-E-V, like levitation, only shorter. And uh, I thought of that probably because of the maglev train in Shanghai, China, which is the fastest land vehicle ever. It magnetically levitates so it can go so fast. But that's the first thing I thought of when I heard your last name, frankly, because I'm Mm -hmm. just a geek for that stuff. But indeed, front slash Lev is where they will find out about the Bay Area CBT Center. And when they click on that wonderful link, what are they going to find, Abby? Well, um, I have a group practice of therapists and coaches. And um, if you want an online therapist or coach, and also there's some worksheets, there's videos about cognitive behavioral therapy, there's questionnaires that you could take about your core beliefs. Uh, There's webinars and online courses. So whether you want to find a therapist or you want to do your own self-improvement work, you could find it all. Fantastic. And also, guys, Abby Lev's wonderful books, Act for Couples and Act for Interpersonal Problems, can both be found at the top of the queue on my Amazon Influencer page, which you can reach by going to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon as always. Abby Lev from the Bay Area CBT Center. This has been a fun and entertaining conversation. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and uh, sharing your wisdom with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, it was fun. Yes, indeed. And guys, if you have not been to mountaintoppodcast.com lately, check out our sponsors, both Origin in Maine and Hero Soap Company. Origin in Maine has the best hoodie you've ever seen seen or certainly worn in your entire life right now they're taking orders on those made in america top quality just like everything else in the entire origin in main line go to mountaintoppodcast.com slash origin and get you some 
Also, speaking of top quality, go to Hero Soap. Check out the body wash and check out the bars of soap that smell great, make you smell like a man and feel like a man. You can go to mountaintoppodcast.com, click on the link there, or go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash hero soap. Whether you choose to work with my friends over at Origin in Maine or Hero Soap, use the coupon code mountain10 to get 10% off your order. Also, guys, listen up. It's going to be the end of the year 2021 real soon. Fall is upon us. The holidays are here. Women are looking for a man to spend the holidays with. I think they call it cuffing season. Yeah, I don't know about that term, but that's what they call it. Nonetheless, the truth of the matter is whether you're online or meeting women in person, not only do you need to get out there and approach these women in order to meet them, like we've talked about at length today, you also have to be the man those women are looking for. You have to deserve what you want. Talk to me for free for 25 minutes and we can put a plan of action together that transforms you into that guy so you can start getting the relationship you want with the right woman in your life. Go to mountaintoppodcast.com, click on the red button in the upper right-hand corner, and let's talk. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. <laughs> Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.